For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Hello and welcome to a presentation on the Great Controversy, the battle for your choice. This is the first presentation in the series and as it is the beginning, I've entitled it, The Very Beginning. My name is Paul and it is a great honor and privilege to be spending a bit of time with you, going through some of the deepest things that we could ever be exposed to on this planet. As mentioned, there is a battle going on universally and is known as the battle between good and evil. And it is also called the Great Controversy. And it is all about the battle for your choice. I have a medical background and, an, and I apologize in advance if I do become a little technical at times, but I've attempted to keep things as simple as possible. So without any further ado, let's get started. The beginning. Let's start at the beginning. This is the beginning of these presentations. So let's start at the very beginning. The beginning of what you might say? The beginning of the presentation? Yes. The beginning of the Bible? Yes. The beginning of time? Yes to all three of these beginnings. But actually, we're going to go way, way further back than this. John 17 verse 17 says, Thy word is truth. What is truth? I believe we'll be looking into truth. Pilate asked this question, what is truth? And John says, thy word is truth. The Bible is God's Word, and we will be using this as our foundation for, this, for our studies, and we will find truth here. God's Word is where I have found truth, and is the ultimate foundation for these presentations. I do, however, also refer to and quote one or two other authors from time to time, who have helped me in my personal search for truth and choice. You will be able to follow these quotes with me on the screen to my right. I wish that I could claim that these thoughts presented here were my own, but I've borrowed most of the thoughts and ideas from others, and I need to give credit where credit is due. There is one book in particular, After the Bible, which has influenced my personal thinking and choices more than any other book. And most of the thoughts in these presentations also are based from ideas and thoughts found in this book. The book is entitled, The Great Controversy, and I do quote from its author at times. I found this book the most appropriate book for our times, and I found it to be inspired and most inspiring. The author, a lady according to my knowledge, is the most widely authored female writer in America, and maybe the world. She wrote over 200 books and many, many more articles and pamphlets, from which I also do quote from, ta from time to time. I'm sure that by reading and studying the Bible, God's Word, and reading the great controversy, you may come to the same conclusion as I have. But these presentations are not about coming to conclusions. These presentations are about making choices. I would, however, right from the outset, encourage you to try and get this book, The Great Controversy, and read it. It goes into much more detail, detail and depth than what we will see in these presentations, and it will be a blessing to you. There will be details on the screen about the special promotional offer that I'm making available to you, and where you can get the special shortened version of The Great Controversy, entitled the great hope at the end of each presentation. So let's go to the beginning. Let's go to the first verse 
in the first chapter of the first book in the most important book ever written. Let's go to Genesis 1 verse 1 and it says, In the beginning, God. We're going to stop right there. In the beginning, God. Genesis, the book of beginnings, takes us to the very beginning, right back to God. So my beginning question then is, the very first question I'm going to ask you, what was before God? And I'm sure you'll answer me nothing. Can we prove this? Can we prove that nothing was before God? John 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Here we have it again, right in the beginning was God. The Word was God, and the Word was with God. Psalms 90 verse 2 says, Before thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. From when is everlasting to everlasting? This is forever. God is before all things and all beginnings. He is the beginning of all beginnings. Colossians 1 verse 18 says, Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead? And Revelation 1 verse 8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. The point, what is the point that I'm trying to make? The point that I'm trying to make is nothing was before God. He, he, he had no beginning because he is the beginning of all things. He is the beginning of all beginnings. So God was before everything. He was before anything was created. He was before the universe was created. He was before the angels were created. He was before intelligent beings, you and I, angels, were created. He was before this world was created. He was therefore also before humans were created, as I mentioned. And thus, yes, logically, before you and I were created, God was. He calls himself the I am. He has always been. So, in the beginning, God. So then, who is God? Who is this eternal supreme being who calls himself the I am who, are, who was before all beginnings and is the beginning of all beginnings? Job 11 verse 7 says, Canst thou by searching find out God? We cannot find out God except as he reveals or chooses to reveal himself. We are thus on holy ground here. Can I define God? Can I try and say this is what God is like? Never. I quote from uh, the author of The Great Controversy. Let us never undertake to define God as an essence. And those who seek to define God are on forbidden ground. We are to enter in no, into no controversy regarding God, what he is and what he is not. He, the omniscient one, is above discussion. So, can we define God? Never. We cannot place God in a box and say, this is what God is like. Can we describe God? The answer is no. We have limited understanding. But God is limitless. Only He describes Himself to us as he chooses. So, can we have a picture of God? Can we have a mental picture of God? Can we have an, a, a, a way of thinking about this eternal being? And the answer is yes. 
more importantly, can we know God? And the answer here is, of course, emphatically yes. We can and must know God, about Him personally and intimately. It is one of the main aims of these presentations to introduce God, this eternal supreme being, to you and present you with choices regarding your understanding and relationship with Him. So, who is God then? 1 John 4 verse 8 and 16 says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. 1 John 4 verse 8 and 16. God is love. This is the greatest concept you can ever try to look into. You will, however, never be able to fully understand it. Colossians 2 verse 3 says, There is no knowledge outside of these words. For in them are hid all the treasures of the wisdom and knowledge, and without is only ignorance and darkness. These three words of nine letters have in them the deepest mystery hidden, yet revealed and this mystery, as we look into this concept of love, we will see it revealed more and more. As we look into love, we are going to discover who God really is. When you really begin to understand and accept this statement, God is love, then your whole picture of God will begin to change. And your choices will begin to change too. You will then begin to see that in all 66 books of the Bible, that every last single act that God has ever done has been done from the motivation of love. God is love. This statement is as eternally true as God himself is because it is what he is. In this sense only can we say that love defines God and God defines love, as well as love describes God and God describes love. It is the closest thing that we can come to, de to defining or describing God, love. But it is our privilege, however, to understand and know God. Yes, we can and must know love. God is love. What do these words mean? What can it mean but that love is the controlling characteristic, the one attribute of God from which all other attributes come from and can all be traced back to? All his attributes, the attributes are the attributes of love. His justice, his wisdom, his power, his mercy, and even his wrath and anger, which we read about in the Bible, are only different faces of love. Yes, eternal love. Yes, of God himself. Every last single motive of God's actions must and have come from love. Love has no motive of pride or policy. It has but one motive, and that is love itself. Love gives pleasure to the person loved, thus to receive pleasure in return. Let's look at the circle of life, the circle of love, the circle of life itself. Love wants love and love gives love. Love's purpose is to give love and get love, and love exists for love's sake. The only way to get love is to give love, and the only way to give love is to get love. Love gets to give. This is the circle of love. Yes, the circle of life itself. There is no love outside of love. God is life and God is love. In the beginning, however, there was only the Godhead. To give and get love, you need someone to give and receive it from. The Godhead has always existed and this love has always existed. Love, however, always wants to grow, grow, expand and get bigger. That means more love. More love means more beings to love. And more beings to love means more love comes back to the Creator. All love, life, all life exists to give 
and get love. But in the beginning, there, however, was only God. In the beginning, God. So let's look at this concept of expanding love. God created beings, the angels, human beings, for this very reason, to be able to grow the circle of love. The beginning of life, yes, our creation, our life too, is the beginning of, and the expansion of the divine thought of love. More beings means more love, which increases and expands the circle of love. Love's goal and motive then is more love, expanding love and increasing love. Yes, this means more love for you and more love for me too. This is the unselfish circle of love. Love and the circle of love is the circle of life itself and can function and live only within the realms and circle of love. We need to go back way further though, way, way back and consider what were the implications of love and God being a God of love. This goes right back to God and way before the beginning. So hold on tight now as we go way back to the very beginning, all the way back to God, who is love and this life itself. The circle of love is the circle of life itself. And the circle of life is the circle of love itself. Life cannot exist outside of love. And love cannot exist without life. Thus, love is life. The one cannot exist without the other. To begin to understand God, then we need to understand love. Let's go into this incredible concept of love then. Can love be forced? Can you hold a gun to your wife's head and say, Love me or I'll kill you, or to your girlfriend, or any other person that you love. Can we do it? Never. Love can only happen by freedom of choice. Love can never, ever be forced or coerced. Then it is no longer love. Love can never use force. So if love cannot be forced, it can only happen by free choice. Love must happen by free choice. Love gets by free choice and love gives by free choice. There is no other way for love to happen. So if love can only happen by free choice, then you can also choose to not love. Am I right? There's an absolute in the universe of God. There is therefore nothing that God values in His universe more than the freedom of choice. Why? Because freedom of choice allows love to happen. Are you still with me? This is the only way to have love. This is so important that I must repeat it again. There is nothing in God's free universe that He values more than freedom of of choice. Love can only happen in an environment of freedom of choice. So the very foundation of love is free choice and therefore any other aspect of love must be built on the foundation of choice. Freedom of choice then means that you must have a free moral agent. What is a free moral agent? A free moral agent then is as an intelligent being with the ability to reason and to choose, to love or not to love, the ability to make moral or universal binding decisions. So the being must be intelligent and have the ability to reason and to have the freedom of choice. What is the opposite of freedom? I've just mentioned a couple. I'm sure you could come up with a whole lot of other uh, synonyms for lack of freedom or no freedom. Uh, no fr uh, of freedom, no freedom, slavery, no love, 
you are an automaton. That's the term I'm going to use from time to time. An automaton, when you hear that term, just put in the word robot. That means that you are like a robot. You can only do what you're told to do. If you cannot choose to love, you cannot choose not to love, you are a robot. You also do not have the capacity of independent, intelligent thought or reasoning. So, what is love? We've seen that God is love. What is the opposite of love? Selfishness or sin. And we're going to see that sin is the most expensive thing in the whole universe. And we'll see that it means slavery. It means no freedom, no love, and therefore no life. I'm going to change our direction of thought a little bit. We've been looking at God, what He is, and we've discovered that God is love. Is God anything more than love? Is there anything more we could say about this? Exodus 13 verse four, 3 verse 14 says, And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. I am who I am. Yes, God is who He is. By choosing to be love, because love can only happen by free choice. God is who He is. Love. But is God more than love? Yahweh, Jehovah, the great I am. The Jewish forefathers were, uh, held this name in so much reverential and sacred um, honor that it was almost feared. The eternal presence, the utterance um, of the eternal presence of God, this everlasting God that was from everlasting to everlasting. They uttered it sacredly. They would not even utter it. Why? Why this reverential fear? Yahweh. Is God not love? Sin means selfishness inherently inside, inside of me, inside of a sinful being. Can sin exist in the presence of God, of love himself? Never. They are life and death opposites. The one must destroy the other or be destroyed itself. As we will see, one is stronger than the other. Love conquers all. God is love, and His love is His glory. Deuteronomy 4 verse 24 and Hebrews 12 verse 28 give this concept very clearly. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire. And Isaiah 33 verse 14 says, The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness, fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with a devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with the everlasting burnings? And the answer comes in verse 15. He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. God is love and his love is his glory and his glory is a consuming fire. To sin, wherever found, our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12 verse 29 says, in all, uh, this is what Hebrews 12 verse 29 says, in all who submit to his power, the spirit of God will consume sin. But if men cling, cling to sin, they become identified with it. Then the glory of God, which destroys sin, must destroy them. At the second, second coming of Christ, the wicked shall be consumed with the spirit of his mouth and destroyed with the brightness of his coming. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8. This is God's glory. This is love. And this is the, the eternal everlasting God we're talking about. God is love. This is his glory. We will also discover and discuss in some detail that the light of the glory of God, which is love, which imparts life to the righteous, will destroy the wicked. It is the same love that does this. Love does not decide this for us. We choose. It is not arbitrary. It is just what love does. So as we get to the end of this presentation, we see God is love. It is his glory and it's a consuming fire. 
God is life. So love is life. So no love means no life. This is death. Proverbs 8 verse 36 says, But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. You either love God and life, or you love death and cease to exist. God is everlasting only because he is love. So his glory, which is his love, is everlasting. So is hatred and destruction, so is his hatred of, and destruction of sin everlasting. And he is thus an everlasting fire of destruction to sin, but an everlasting source of life where there is no sin. This is God. This is love. This is life itself. You cannot change this, and God himself cannot change himself, except to be something other than love. Maybe sin, maybe death. And love hates and deplores this, and this is the opposite. To be love and to give love and to get love has huge implications then. God, who is love, could forever give love and life to beings who chose to stay inside of love. love. But love would also have to respect the choice of a free moral agent and allow that free moral agent to choose to not love if he so chose and thus to step outside of love and thus to step outside of life itself. To be able to love, you must be and have a free moral agent to give and get love from. And this has huge implications and we will explore this in quite a bit of depth in the next presentation. In the next presentation, we will be looking more deeply into what was required for the freedom of choice to have ever existed and more deeply into this concept of a free moral agent. Friends, I now ever need to remind you that we are in a cosmic battle, a universal battle called the Great Controversy. And this battle is the battle for your choice. Right now, I want to invite you to make some choices with me, which are based on this presentation. The first one that we'll look into today is, I want to invite you to choose to accept there is a God who has always existed and was before all things and created all things. I invite you to choose to thank the Creator for creating you with the um, ability to have freedom of choice, reason and intelligence. And lastly, choose to keep listening to these presentations and discovering that God is love. Thank you for listening. And until next time, choose to make positive choices. God bless and goodbye.